the waste of idleness, whose very languor is a punishment heavier than the act of souls can feel or guess. Wordsworth Chapter 1 Ah, it's a dull world, a dull world. Hamlet was right, flat, stale, and unprofitable. Flat as the jokes of a pernicious punster, stale as the maneuvers of women, and as unprofitable as a newspaper or a lecture. Frederick Faulkner, as he drawled out the last word, let fall the pamphlet which he had been endeavoring to read, and stretched himself out at full length on one of the luxurious settees in the ladies' parlor at the Astor. With his arms beneath his head and his eyes half shut, he lay for some time, gazing wearily at the different articles of furniture, wondering why people gave themselves to the troubles to construct them, and, at intervals, expanding his finely shaped mouth to the utmost dimensions by a long but silent yawn. The drawing-room was vacant, for at that hour in the morning the ladies busied themselves in their own apartments, and the idlers of the other sex found greater attractions in the smoking and reading rooms. It was therefore some time before the tediousness of Faulkner's meditations were disturbed. At length the door opened, but he did not trouble himself to alter his recumbent posture, nor had he sufficient energy to start at the possibility of a feminine intruder. Hello, Fred, exclaimed Frank Gaylord with a laugh. Is that you? Are you asleep? Asleep? I wish I was, half sighed, half yawned Faulkner. Asleep? Sleep is too great a luxury for a fellow who is tired to death of all the world and himself into the bargain. Thank you for the implied compliment, returned Gaylord. The world is much obliged to you, so is your humble servant. It's the first time, then, I ever put the world under obligation, replied Faulkner listlessly. Perhaps that is the very reason you are so desperately disgusted with it. A man generally takes interest in his debtors, you know. Another long yawn accompanied by an elongation of his well-dressed limbs was Faulkner's only reply. Gaylord was one of those happy beings who carries about a heart as light as his purse, exemplifying the proverb that the absence of weight in one counterbalances the ill effects of emptiness in the other. Full of projects, of activity, of hope, kindly in his feelings, almost undiscriminating in his affections. He never gave offense and was never offended. Consequently, the loud, light laugh which broke from his lips as he contemplated the prostrate ennui awoke no unpleasant emotions. Glad you're amused, said Faulkner, turning on his side. That's generous of you, my dear fellow, to find happiness in affording others what you cannot enjoy yourself. But let us know, Fred, what unexpected misfortune has tumbled you into the slough of despond, questioned Gaylord. Never had a misfortune in my life. What ails you, then? You don't look like a dyspeptic. You are not encumbered with a scolding wife. Report says you are worth ten thousand a year. And ten thousand blue devils to heighten its enjoyment. Dyspepsia would be something to think about and a scolding wife went awake. I'm dying of a stupor, occasioned by the absence of sensations. Why do you not travel? Oh, I've traveled, been jolted in every stagecoach, shaken in every rail car, and cribbed up in every steamboat in Europe. Did me no good. Men and women, hills and mountains, lakes and rivers, herbs and trees, same all over. Come, there is another panacea for ennui. Matrimony. Why do you not get married? To some woman who thinks ten thousand a year sufficient inducement to permit me to encircle her finger with a ring and hang a chain upon my own inclinations. 
a rich man has not the privilege of marrying a wife. He can only expect to play the husband to a mercenary woman. That occupation is not to my taste. Nor, upon my word, does any other occupation seem to be. I beg your pardon, my dear Fred, but why do you not employ yourself? Oh, I've tried it. Tried to drink. Gave me a headache. Preferred not to make a beast of myself. Tried to smoke. Made me qualmish. Preferred not smelling like an old pipe. Tried to gamble. No fun in losing. Tried everything. It's no go. Having a pulse for enjoyment. Don't know what to do with myself. Tiresome world. He concluded his sentence with a succession of yawns and stretching out his arm for an additional cushion which he placed beneath his head, laid himself on his back with his mouth half open and his eyes fixed upon the ceiling. Gaylord turned away, for he found the yawns contagious and was about to leave the room. Just as he reached the door, he looked back and said, "'By the way, Fred, they tell me you have a lawsuit pending. "'Why don't you amuse yourself with looking after that? "'Who is likely to win?' "'Don't know, don't care. "'If old Scrapeall gets it, I shan't be worth a copper. "'Can't help it. "'Don't believe he will. "'Don't care if he does. "'There will be plenty of anxious mamas and marriageable daughters to care, I warrant,' resumed Gaylord. But I'm afraid that your prospects of winning are too good for you to break the fair one's hearts by anything but your indifference. So adieu. I wish you a happy deliverance from your cerulean enemies. And Frank Gaylord made a sudden exit, for he perceived his friend's mouth slowly enlarging itself with another protracted yawn, and his own began to give tokens of sympathetic force of example. Faulkner lay a while longer, and after turning repeatedly from side to side and finding all positions equally uncomfortable, he languidly arose to his feet. The mirror, directly in front of him, reflected his attractive person. He walked slowly towards it, passed his finger through his dark and waving hair, contemplated for a moment his regular but inanimate features, and drawled out, "'Wish I wasn't such a good-looking fellow.' Wish I'd been squint-eyed or lame or hunchbacked. Then I'd have something to think about. With this extraordinary regret, he turned away, paced the room once or twice, looked out of the window, first at the gloomy sky above, and then at the peripatetic umbrellas which jostled one another beneath. I'll take a walk, he suddenly exclaimed, with a kind of energy which resembled the desperate flickering of a candle just before it expires in the socket. Mackintosh, India rubber shoes, can't get wet, don't care if I do. He was soon prepared for his promenade, and slowly descended the steps of the aster, spreading his umbrella as he gave vent to his favorite ejaculation of, tiresome world, oh, very. It was a day in March, and the air was getting cutting as the breath of scandal. The rain fell, was fine but penetrating, and the rain that darkly carpeted the paving stones rendered the walking slippery and difficult. Faulkner sauntered, or rather slid, down Broadway, not from any particular choice, but because his face happened to be turned in that direction when he issued from the hotel. The friends he met were hurrying along, intent on seeking shelter, when his slow pace plainly bespoke that the object of his walk was to find refuge from ennui and its goal any which chance might offer. "'Give us a penny, a penny, please,' was the first sound that saluted his ears at one of the crossings, and two little hands were stretched out within the circumference of his umbrella. He looked down and saw a couple of ragged children, each with a wet broom in one hand, while the other was extended supplicatingly towards him. As a sort of diversion for himself, rather than with any defined desire of being charitable, he thrust his fingers into his waistcoat pocket and drew forth a two-shilling piece. Just as he placed it in the hand of the elderly petitioner, his eye fell upon a third little girl who stood near the others. 
She was busily sweeping the crossing, and though she did not stretch forth her hand, she looked up at his face with a half-timid, half-imploring look, and then pertinaciously plied her broom. "'Divide it amongst you! Give that little girl some!' exclaimed Faulkner as he passed on. After walking a few paces farther, he turned back to take one more look at the little street sweeps. The two that had addressed him were evidently quarreling about the alms which he had bestowed. The third little girl stood leaning upon her broom, anxiously regarding them, but without taking part in the dispute. Faulkner had an eye for the beautiful under all its guises and disguises, and he could not help remarking the almost inappropriate grace of the little girl's attitude. Her form, too, was remarkably slender, and mean as was her garment, there was an air of taste in its arrangement. The folded red shawl crossed over her expanding bosom and knotted behind, displayed the delicate roundness of her waist, the striped skirt, cut so short that it escaped all contact with the mud, exposed to view a pair of small and well-turned ankles, the shoes, but those were large, badly shaped, and much worn, and if the feet within them corresponded to the ankles, the shoemaker had done himself no credit. Then the little blue hood, tied so closely over the pale face, the parlor of that face reminded him of the sorrowful expression of the large dark eyes that were for a moment turned to his. Faulkner walked slowly on, pondering upon the misery of street sweepers in general, and of this little trio in particular. One of his habitual yawns, which at that moment surprised him, made him come to the conclusion that after all they were not to be pitied as much as himself, and once or twice more exclaiming, "'Tiresome world! Tiresome world!' he turned to retrace his steps, with the intent, perhaps, of again wooing Morpheus upon the comfortable lounges at the Aster. Once more he approached the crossing where the three little girls were stationed. Two of them were just starting in pursuit of a fat, good-natured-looking gentleman, who seemed half disposed to listen to their prayers. The third, the one who had temporarily excited his interest, was still industriously sweeping away the mud, although her ungloved and purpled hands seemed almost too cold to grasp her broom. At the sound of his steps, she raised her head, apparently recognized Faulkner, for the ashy hue of her cheek gave way to a slight flush. Then, with even quicker movements, resumed her occupation. "'Here, little girl,' said Faulkner, yielding to a sudden impulse of generosity. "'Take this!' And he placed in her half-frozen hand a gold piece worth two and a half dollars. The child, for she was scarcely more, gave one bewildered look at the gold, convulsively closed her fingers upon it, and with a cry of joy, which was almost wild in its sound, darted down the nearest street. Her broom, which she still grasped, trailed after her without impeding her progress. The strings of her little blue hood loosened, and it fell to the ground, but she did not pause to recover it. Faulkner caught but one glimpse of the brown hair that curled in close round rings about her head, and she had disappeared. For several moments he stood gazing abstractly at the corner round which she vanished. The inquisitive glances of passer-by recalled him to a sense of the ridiculousness of his situation. With a quicker step he returned to the aster and sought the lady's parlour, but he no longer felt any inclination to throw himself upon the settee, for his eyes had lost their heaviness and his limbs partook of the activity of his mind. He walked about with rapid steps, that pale, thin face ever and anon rising before him, and the strange cry that had burst from the little girl's lips ringing in his ear. And then he pictured to himself the relief, or at least the pleasure, which his accidental donation had afforded this unfortunate child, and wondered if her pale cheeks were not at that moment flushed, and her eyes bright, and congratulated himself as the author of the unwanted hue and happy luster.
At least I have purchased myself a sensation, cheap at two dollars and a half, and I do believe I have not yawned these three hours. As he uttered these words, the dinner bell disrupted his reverie, and he hastened down with unusual accompaniment of an appetite. Before night, however, he had almost forgotten the little street sweep, and his ennui returned with redoubled violence. Chapter 2 In the basement of a house situated in one of the most obscure parts of the city sat an old and decrepit man bending over a small table. Everything about him bespoke the most abject poverty. In his trembling hands he held a pen, and before him lay a paper which, strange to say, bore strong resemblance to a will. He was in the act of signing it, and two females stood beside him, evidently as witnesses. He scarcely made one stroke with a pen before a violent fit of coughing interrupted his labors. Completely exhausted, he laid back in his chair, and the elder of the women advanced to support his head, but at the same time gave utterance to an exclamation of petulant disappointment. "'You shall have it all, all when I am gone, but that won't be yet all. Lucy shall never see the color of my gold. Never fear, never fear. I say you shall have it all. You are better now. Come, sign, sign, answered the woman, forcing her harsh voice to imitate the tone of kindness. Your signature is wanting. Never fear, never fear, plenty of time. I'm not going yet. Another violent fit of coughing seemed to contradict his words. The repulsive countenance of the elder woman was distorted by mingled vexation and dread. She evidently exerted an all-powerful influence over the old man, and yet, though shattered by disease and the influence of evil passions, though sinking prematurely into his dotage, his ruling love, avarice, was stronger even than her fierce and despotic will. "'It's mine. The money's mine. Abby, you shall have it when I'm below ground, but it's all mine yet, and there's more coming to it. More, more. Never fear.' Abby replied by placing the pen in his hand and whispering, "'Yes, more, but sign, or it will be Lucy's one day. Come, your name. Hiram Scrapeall. It's soon written. As she spoke, she placed her own hand upon the one that held the pen and commenced grinding the fingers over the paper. A knock at the outer door, a low and timid knock, made the old man start up and drop the pen, for he was weak and nervous. What's that, Abby? What's that? he demanded, trembling. "'Go and see,' said Abby Conklin to the daughter. "'But do not admit anybody!' The young girl, for though so old in appearance, so withered by care and worn by calculation, she had numbered but few years, gave a warning look to her mother and left the room. A few moments afterwards a beseeching voice was heard in the entry. "'Let me see him! I must! I will!' With a sudden movement darting by the person who was attempting to prevent her entrance, a girl some fourteen or fifteen years of age rushed into the room. Mrs. Conklin seized her rudely by the arm, but she broke loose, and with one bound stood beside the old man who was groaning and shaking in his chair. "'Who is it? Who is it?' he gasped out, shrinking away from the intruder. Her thin and pallid face— and those large, penetrating eyes fixed on his, alarming him. "'It's Grace, your own grandchild,' answered the little girl in an excited, yet not unmusical tone. "'My mother is starving, dying. That woman,' pointing to Mrs. Conklin, "'has driven me from your door day after day, but your own child is dying of want, and I would see you.' "'Let her die!' fiercely ejaculated Mrs. Conklin. "'She married a beggar against her father's will. "'What should her child be but a beggar? 
and that in consequence of his will? And as she shrieked forth these words, she pointed savagely to the document lying on the table. Grace turned slowly around, and even that evil woman quailed before her rebuking look and the pitying reproach of her tone as she said, You are a wicked woman. God forgive you. It was you who made my mother's life so wretched. She married to escape from your persecutions. You incensed my grandfather against her. She is now almost... The word that she was trying to utter seemed to choke her. Starving, she exclaimed at length with a strong effect. And yet she is happier in the midst of misery than all her father's wealth can render you in the very lap of luxury. Livid with rage, Mrs. Conklin once more seized the girl by the arm and attempted to force her out from the room. Grandfather, grandfather, my poor mother! The old man seemed too terrified and bewildered exactly to com comprehend what had passed. He looked at Mrs. Conklin, whose iron grasp had completely mastered Grace, with a vacant stare, and then gazing at the young girl muttered, Take her away! Take her away! Do you hear that? shrilly screamed Mrs. Conklin. But perhaps he will give a message that you can carry to your dainty mother, she added maliciously. Then addressing the old man, he asked, What about Lucy? What were you saying of Lucy? Voice seemed to arouse him and to recall the train of thought which Grace had interrupted, for he groaned out, She shall never see the color of my money. Never fear, never fear. The money's mine, all oh, mine. I'm not going yet. Never fear. Grace was too much shocked by these words to make any further resistance to Mrs. Conklin's will. Almost before she knew how she came there, she stood in the street, and the door was closed against her. Mrs. Conklin had returned to the room to witness the appending of Scrapeall's signature to the document which made her heir to a miser's carefully accumulated wealth. Chapter 3 "'I hate fine weather when the wind is so strong!' exclaimed Faulkner peevishly, putting his out his chamber window. "'How fast the sidewalks are drying! Street sweeps will soon be on Othello's predicament. Occupation gone. Dull times for them, just as dull for other people!' And Faulkner drew his head in and closed the window, with more spleen and perhaps more energy than was his wont. In a few moments more he was walking in the same direction as on the previous day, but his pace was brisker, there was less languor depicted on his features, less heaviness in his whole mien. He looked as though he had, or was persuading himself that he had, some end to accomplish, some duty to fulfill. Before he had gone far, his steps unconsciously grew quicker, and his eyes were eagerly fixed upon some object in the distance. Was it his little street sweep? He felt certain that it was she, and yet her back was turned, and the pretty blue hood had been replaced by a faded bondress handkerchief apparently tied beneath her chin. Her head was drooped dejectedly on her bosom, and she moved her broom more languidly on the preceding day. I wonder if she is very poor, if she has parents, if they are suffering. What she does with herself when the pavement is not muddy, whether she, whether she, whether she finds it a tiresome world. And for once Faulkner murmured these last two words to himself without the accompaniment of a yawn. He had approached the little girl unperceived. "'Mud's drying, eh?' She started violently at the sound of his voice, and the fair face raised to his was suffused with crimson. After a glance of recognition and a slight quivering of the lips, as though words of thanks for his yesterday's charity were hovering upon them, 
she attempted to continue sweeping, but her hands trembled, and the broom, though it shook beneath them, seemed fastened to the ground, and the black mud lay unmolested upon it. Every instant Faulkner became more interested. He did not care who saw him, for he was generally too indifferent to everything to be tenacious of the world's opinion. A conversation with a street sweep was something novel. He who had found the world so dull could not lose the opportunity of enjoying any novelty, however it might subject him to ridicule. "'Have you parents?' inquired he of the little girl. "'Only a mother,' she replied in a low voice, the sound of which thrilled him strangely. "'And she is poor. Very, very poor.' and a suppressed sob caught his ear as she articulated the last word. "'Do you live far from here?' The girl shook her head, for she was too much abashed or moved to give utterance to the negative. "'Come,' said Faulkner. Suddenly his countenance brightened until his expression became truly beautiful. "'I will go see your mother. Will you show me the way?' The girl looked at him a moment her face full of wonder. He returned her glance with a shrug of the shoulders, which was followed by a smile. The first said, "'If you choose, you need not believe me.' The last said, "'Indeed, I am in earnest.' There was too much encouragement in that smile for her to doubt its meaning. "'My mother will thank you,' she murmured with a swelling heart, and commenced in walking in the same direction which she had taken with so much speed on the previous day. Faulkner followed at a short distance behind her, muttering to himself, an odd way of putting the blue devils to flight, like it because it's new, walk will do me good. The last casual exclamation awoke an unusual train of thoughts, and he added thoughtfully, good. I shouldn't wonder if it did, in more ways than one. I begin to feel as if it had done me some good already. The girl turned into a very narrow and filthy street. Faulkner's dainty senses, especially his olfactory organs, began to excite him in a repugnance to following her any further. He was deliberating upon the practicality of giving her a few dollars and turning back, when for the first time she looked around. One more glance at that pallid face silenced the murmurings of the rebellious sense, and he walked briskly on. In a few moments more, the girl stopped at the head of a flight of steps, which led into a cellar, dignified by the name of a basement story. She descended and entered a small room, dark, damp, cold, and cheerless. A few ashes on the hearth, told that on the previous night some attempt had been made to kindle a fire of chips, but now not even a dying spark gave out its feeble warmth. There was neither chair nor table in the room, but an old box served as both. The only article of furniture was a narrow cot. A slumbering woman lay upon it, but so completely enveloped in a thick woolen blanket that only a small portion of her face was visible. This blanket was almost the only covering of the bed, but it was warm, clean, and apparently new. After giving one hasty glance around the room, Faulkner's eyes rested upon the comfortable blanket. Those of the young girl followed his, and smiling, t'was a faint and sad smile, the first that he had seen illume her countenance, she whispered, She sleeps. For many nights the cold would not let her sleep, but she is warm now. The money you gave me bought this. And she laid her hand upon the blanket and looked into his face with an expression of gratitude that made Faulkner draw his breath with unwanted rapidity, while a thrill of pleasure sent blood to his cheek and unusual moisture to his eye. He felt as though that small piece of gold, so little prized by him, had purchased more than the one sensation upon which he had congratulated himself the day before, and that even the warm woolen blanket was not the most valuable thing it had procured. Several minutes he stood, contemplating the slumbering woman, for the young girl made no attempt to disturb her rest. 
The face of the sleeper was, if possible, even more ghastly than that of her child. Disease had aided want in imparting to those regular and delicate features a death-like hue. Never was the stamp of suffering more legible. And yet there was a placidity upon the sleeping face, an air of resignation that softened the impress of sorrow and gave an expression almost angelic to the wan countenance. At an involuntary movement of Faulkner's, the closed lids quivered and slowly opened. A look of terror convulsed the woman's feature at the sight of a stranger standing beside her cot. "'Grace! Where's Grace?' she almost shrieked. "'By your side, mother,' replied Grace softly, and then, bending her head close to her mother's, she whispered a few words which explained the appearance of so unusual a visitor. But the mother seemed scarcely satisfied. She looked at her child inquiringly, and at Faulkner almost with dread. The tongue of the latter refused to perform its appointed office. He shrank, without knowing why, before that searching glance, and turned to the young girl as though appealing to her to relieve his embarrassment. "'We have not thanked him, mother,' said Grace, half reproachfully. "'Oh, I want no thanks. Don't mention it,' answered Faulkner, suddenly regaining the use of his tongue. "'I hope that I shall be able to do something for you, my good woman. I shall try. Upon my word, I will. But I see you're busy now. That is, I'm in haste myself, so I won't detain you.' I mean, I can't stay any longer. You must uh, make yourself comfortable here. A little present from a friend, only a trifle. And he dropped the well-filled purse, which he had agitatedly drawn from his pocket upon the bed. He was turning away hastily, but Grace seized his hand, and, her face streaming with tears, pressed it between her own icy palms and said, Oh, sir, you, you have saved my mother. God will reward you. And then, as though ashamed of this burst of emotion, she hung her head, and covering her face with her hands, wept in silence. Faulkner was too much unused to such situations to know how to act. He twirled his hat with an air of indecision for a moment, then bowed to the mother, who, leaning upon her elbow, was steadfastly regarding him, and hastily withdrew. A thousand thronging thoughts gave activity to his brain as he walked homeward. I must do something for them. A little of the money, nothing but a curse to me. What a blessing it might be to them. She shall sweep the streets no longer. I wonder what she can do. Mentua-making, millinery, waistcoat-stitching, profitable but tedious, too tedious. Wish I could hit upon something pleasanter. While these thoughts were chasing each other through his mind, his eyes accidentally rested upon a bunch of orange blossoms, which was conspicuously displayed in the window of an establishment for making artificial flowers. Flower making, joining together the brightly colored leaves, blending them in form, weaving them in wreaths, those delicate little hands of hers are just suited to such an occupation. It will be easy to obtain her admission as an apprentice here. Money can accomplish that, if it is not to be done any other way. Then, when she has learnt the art, an establishment of her own. She shall be its mistress. I will advance her mother the capital. Flower-making, flower-making, the little street sweeper, a maker of artificial flowers and he rubbed his hands together as he spoke, in actual delight. Then, walking into the store, he purchased the identical bunch of orange blossoms which first attracted his attention, and, entering into conversation with the mistress of the establishment, soon obtained from her all the information concerning her occupation which he desired. He had built a thousand castles in the air before he reached the Aster. And again and again he pictured the little street sweep and her mother in an elevated position, healthy, happy, prosperous, all through his exertions. Since the days of his boyhood, his heart had not beat so lightly, nor his spirits been so buoyant. 
Frank Gaylord accidentally encountered him upon the stairs. "'Well, Fred, tiresome world, eh?' said Gaylord, accosting him laughingly. "'My dear Frank, I've just come to the conclusion that nothing makes the world so tiresome as to be of no use in it,' replied Faulkner, shaking hands with him warmly. "'Take care of my arm, will you?' replied Gaylord, withdrawing his hand from Faulkner's grasp. "'Remember, my dear fellow, that I do not suffer from the same absence of sensation as you do.' And the friends parted. That night, sweet sleep and sweeter dreams visited Faulkner's pillow. Immediately after breakfast, he took a walk, in the hope of seeing Grace at her usual post. Her little companions were there, but she was absent. He returned home, and after a few hours again walked that way. Still she did not appear. Again towards dusk he sought, but he did not find her. Impatient to put into execution his schemes for her benefit, he hurried to the house whither she had conducted him on the previous day. He found it without difficulty, with a throbbing heart descended the flight of steps and knocked. No answer. Again and again the knock was repeated, and at last his impatience gaining a victory over his discretion, he opened the door and entered the room. It was empty. The cot was gone. No fire, nor even ashes upon the hearth. The old box was all that remained to assure him that he was not mistaken in the room disappointed and almost confounded, he left the apartment through a door which opened into an entry and walked upstairs to seek someone whom he could question concerning Grace and her mother. He encountered an old woman upon the stairs. To his half-articulated and hasty inquiries she replied, "'Lord bless you, sir, they took themselves off by daylight this morning. Poor enough they are, but they paid the rent down.' The little girl was taken on sadly, and the mother hardly able to stir a limb, but they would go. I believe it was something about a wild young man, and the mother thought it best Grace should not be in his way, for she's a handsome girl, sir, but that's the short and long of their going off so sudden-like. Faulkner had not the heart to ask another question. Frustrated in his first endeavor to be of service to his fellow creatures, disappointed in the first scheme with which he for years had endeavored to occupy himself, he returned home dissatisfied, sad, and weary. And yet those mingled feelings were less oppressive than the blank overspreading the mind, that distaste for enjoyment, and sluggishness of thought called ennui. Chapter 4 a year after the occurrence of the events related in the previous chapter, Frederick Faulkner was seated in a small office in the fourth story of a building in Wall Street. Upon the table before him lay a number of legal-looking papers, carefully fastened with red tape. He was apparently occupied in another which was to be added to their number. One glance at his features, his attitude, his movements, told that he was no longer the weary idler, the listless ennuyé who had found the world and its occupants so exceedingly tiresome twelve months before. Actually, a couple of weeks after his rencontre with the little street sweeper and her sudden disappearance, Scrapeall unexpectedly gained the lawsuit upon which Faulkner's wealth depended. He found himself suddenly deprived of the means of sustenance. Strange to say, he invinced little chagrin on the occasion and seemed almost glad to be relieved, even by misfortune, from the lethargic incubus which weighed down his spirits. Before he reached his majority, his father had insisted that he should qualify himself to become a lawyer, and he had accordingly passed an examination and received his diploma but he had not then the energy to commence practice, and necessity did not compel him to abandon his habits of idleness. 
once dependent on his own resources, he seemed inspired with a new spirit. He found the panacea for his greatest ill in occupation and gave promise of becoming eminent in the profession. He never regretted his lost wealth, except when he remembered how many heavy hearts he might have lightened, how many sufferers soothed by its mien, the inexpressible pleasure he had received in befriending the little street sweeper had never been equal and never forgotten. The pale face of the little girl frequently rose before him. The burst of gratitude, the words of thanks, sobbed rather than spoken. These were often in his ears. For many months one glimpse of the broom in the hands of a young girl made him quicken his pace, and his heart would beat tumultuously but he was doomed to continual disappointment. Street sweepers in abundance he encountered every day, but Grace was never among them. After some of these disappointments he would return home, open the box where the beautiful little sprig of orange blossoms had been carefully stored, and bitterly mourn over the unavoidable frustration of his first project for the benefit of a human being. He no longer lodged at the Astor, for he was forced to study economy, his practice being as yet exceedingly limited. He had not visited his old residence, the scene of so many weary hours, for several months, when the arrival of a friend in town brought him once more to the Astor. Frank Gaylord chanced to be the first person who accosted him. "'Where have you been hiding yourself, Fred? What have you been doing with yourself? But I declare you look younger and handsomer than ever.' "'By the way,' he rattled on, "'there's a chance of your regaining your fortune "'with a most delightful encumbrance. "'Scrape all, you know, died some ten months ago. "'A will was found leaving his money to some woman, "'his housekeeper, I believe, "'but the signature to his will was only commenced. "'His property has therefore gone to her his daughter and her child. The mother and young lady are staying here. They are in the parlor at this moment. Let me introduce you. No, no, replied Faulkner. I am not so much in love with money as to contemplate marrying it by means of a priest. Besides, I have a sort of superstition that it is in the keeping of the blue devils who hover around it night and day. I have no inclination to renew my acquaintance with him. But I can tell you, it is in the keeping of an angel, and her acquaintance you will soon have an inclination to make if you see once her face. The most artless, gentle little creature, not yet sixteen, and possessing all the grace and simplicity of a child. I hear that she spends half the day studying under the direction of the most accomplished master, for hers is a strange story, but do let me introduce you. See, there she is, sitting on the sofa beside her mother. Gaylord, as he spoke, drew Faulkner towards the open door. They had taken but one step into the room when a cry of astonishment burst from the lips of the latter, and he stood as though transfixed on the spot, spellbound by an apparition. At the same moment, Grace started from her seat and joyfully sprang towards him. Grace! Grace! Could it be Grace? That fair young child with the rose of health upon her cheek, that beautiful woman who bore about her all the refinement and dignity suited to an elevated station? But Faulkner soon answered the question to himself, when the soft and thrilling voice which so long had haunted his dreams once more addressed him as a benefactor, a first and never forgotten friend. Another six months, and once more the delicate bunch of orange blossoms was taken from its little box, this time to twine among the brown locks that clustered about the blushing cheeks of Grace and over the orange flowers and the rich curls floated a bridal veil, and by the side of Grace stood Faulkner, with more than a bridegroom's happiness pictured upon his radiant countenance. A few moments after the ceremony, which united the young couple, was ended, Frank Gaylord, who officiated as groomsman, whispered to Faulkner as he shook his hand, 
My dear fellow, I wish you joy of the good angel which you have taken to yourself to exercise the blue devils. Thank you, replied Faulkner. But since the day that I discovered that it was a curse to be of no use in the world, they have seldom attacked me. To ensure my happiness, the good angel will only have to remind me. It brings a blessing to bless. She is pretty sure of doing that by her own practical illustration of the maxim. End of Ennui and its Antidote by Anna Cora Mawit